your blood pressure is a sugar problem. Dementia is a sugar problem. Heart disease, stroke. Oh, by the way, the risk for cancer is a sugar problem. So if I keep eating foods that spike my blood sugar, then my risk for all of those things will be elevated. Protein does raise your blood sugar. This is so shocking. My wife was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I needed to be a husband while I was trying to help her. Now, this is the part that was really scary for her. Their life expectancy is reduced by 12 years. When you think about us celebrating 30 years of marriage, how are we going to have additional anniversaries to celebrate? We refuse to accept that she would lose 12 years of life. We need to get her A1C down. In terms of your patients, I know that there's been some success stories. A patient of mine, his name is Otis Smith. I have never been sick a day in my life. I got to be age 62. One day, wow. You got diabetes. So I said, let's get those carbs less than about 30. He thinks about what he's going to eat every day. He plans. And it sounds like a bit of a headache, but a bigger headache is having kidney failure, diabetic neuropathy, where your nerves are so painful that you can't even walk. If I were to give you a story about Gwendolyn Butler, she had been on insulin for 11 years and we got her off of insulin within 45 days. We did it safely. When people say, this is hard, doc, I say it's not as hard as those complications. So if we want to lower our blood sugar the fastest, what is the 85% fix? Dr. Hampton, why is blood sugar the single most important factor that we need to lower to reverse disease? If you have an elevated blood sugar, you're gonna wreak havoc on your body, in particular, your blood vessels and your nerves. And it's a process called glycation where your blood sugar will stick to the proteins and fat and all of that inflammation will cause a lot of damage in your body, leading to almost all chronic medical conditions. Now, I've been treating patients for over 28 years in my clinical practice, and I've seen three to 500 people get off their medications, and they thought they'd never get off their medications, but by simply reducing the thing that causes the most harm, the poison is excessive carbs. And by having a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, they can literally remove the thing that causes all the damage by simply changing their diet. So there's no question that when you think about the leading cause of what makes most of us sick is that excessive high glucose level leading to hyperinsulinemia, leading to insulin resistance, and that insulin resistance then leads to the damage in the arteries and the nerves. So if we can reverse that and prevent that, we will not have all those so-called chronic medical conditions that exist in society today. Absolutely. So when it comes to all these chronic diseases that you mentioned, what specifically is the byproduct of having high blood sugar? We think about different diseases that people have. What, what does high blood sugar correlate to? High blood sugars uh, correlate to what we call metabolic diseases. And when you think about what that means, that means that if you have a high level of insulin in your body because you're eating excessive carbs, that's going to then lead to constriction of your arteries. And when that constriction occurs, that's going to elevate your blood pressure. Well, you, you're also going to have inflammation because you're going to have the influx of macrophages coming in and all of that inflammation is going to lead to damage of those arteries. And that's going to also cause problems with your blood vessels. And, and finally, when you have too much insulin in your body, you're going to have something that's going to lead to your kidneys holding on to the salt. So a lot of people worry about, let's not eat too much salt, but what they need to understand is that the root cause of a blood pressure problem is really because of the high carbs, which leads to too much insulin. And then you hold on to the salt uh, via the aldosterone system. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So, so literally, if we avoid the carbs being elevated, we will not have all of these inflammatory things happening to our blood vessels the constriction of our blood vessels, and the influx of salt. But this is the magical key. There are blood vessels all over the body. In fact, I can only think of a few places where you don't have blood vessels. That's the cornea of the eye, maybe the top layer of your skin, the epidermis, maybe the nails and your, your, in your, in your, your, you know, your hair. But everywhere else, there's blood vessels. Therefore, if you damage blood vessels anywhere, you damage blood vessels everywhere. And so if you think about those nerves that have been impacted by this, those nerves, because of this process called glycation, where the 
nerves are being impacted by the glucose and they kind of join together. It's like glue and it irritates the nerves. It attracts water into the nerves so they swell. So now you have nerves that are irritated and you end up with things like neuropathy if you're, you have diabetes. And these are the things we're trying to avoid by simply keeping our blood sugars normal. So the goal is to stabilize our blood sugars so that all of these downstream negative effects won't occur. What are those negative effects? My risk for dementia is higher because we have nerves in our brain. Uh, we call dementia type 3 diabetes. My risk for uh, things like uh, cancer is higher. And I know you had a previous guest on the show who talked about cancer. Cancer is a metabolic disease. It's called the Warburg effect. And yes, cancer cells primarily use uh, glucose as their primary fuel. So if you avoid excessive glucose, your risk for dementia uh, or cancer goes down. So, so what we want to do is put ourselves in a situation where the things like heart disease, because you have blood vessels around your heart, stroke, because you have blood vessels in your brain, all of these medical conditions that are seemingly different are all the same disease. They're diseases of metabolic dysfunction, primarily caused by disruptions and irritation in our blood vessels. And if we can fix that, and fix our nerves, then we won't have to suffer from all of these chronic medical conditions. And what successes have you seen? Because I know that you've seen so many hundreds of patients in your 28 years as a family obesity specialist doctor. What successes have you seen in terms of lowering their blood glucose and reversing disease? Well, if I were to personalize it, I would start with my wife. My wife was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Now, me and my wife, we've been married for now 30 years. We celebrated 30 years of marriage in 2023. And I knew that as a husband, I needed to be a husband while I was trying to help her. So instead of me trying to guide her, I said, you know what, let me put you in a course by Dr. Eric Westman. And he has this type one diabetes course called adapt to life Now I did that intentionally because I knew that she would hear very critical messages. And the message she heard during that course was that the average A1C of a type 1 uh, person with diabetes is about 8.5. Now, that means her their average blood sugar is 197. Now, this is the part that was really scary for her. When you think about those people with an average blood sugar of 8.5, that, and that's a 200 blood sugar, their life expectancy is reduced by 12 years. 12 years of life is lost. So when you think about us celebrating 30 years of marriage, how are we going to have additional anniversaries to celebrate if my wife has an average A1C of eight? So, so what we did to kind of, what she did one day is she celebrated our anniversary and she created this really cute uh, book that had animated images of us. And it told the story about our first date. It told the story about how we fell in love. And it talked about how we even helped our university, which was Xavier in New Orleans, start a volunteer organization. So, and I, and I, we, we shared that, uh, those images on the Protecting Your Nest podcast, episode 100. Now, I bring that up intentionally because how are we going to continue to tell the story of our life if my wife loses 12 years of life, right? So we refused to accept that an A1C of 8.5 was normal. We refused to accept that she would lose 12 years of life. And so what we did is that we, we learned very early that if we are going to have those normal years of life, we need to get her A1C down to normal. And how do you do that if you have type 1 diabetes? You do that by not having what we call glycemic variability. In other words, those up and down blood sugars that then cause all of this damage. And, and the thing that makes it very challenging is how are you going to match the insulin for a type 1 or even a type 2 who takes insulin with the carbs that's on that package, right? And the answer is, if you have a 25-carb apple or package with 25 carbs, is it really 20 carbs or is it really 30 carbs? There's really no way to really know that for sure because you're kind of guessing. And what happens is if you don't match it perfectly, you're going to have either a sugar that's too high or a blood sugar that's too low. And you end up on this roller coaster, a roller coaster of up and down sugar. So wouldn't it make more sense? Wouldn't it make more sense to simply eat less carbs 
instead of having a meal with 25 carbs, how about if we have a meal that only has five carbs? So when you're trying to match that number, maybe it's four, maybe it's six, but if you're off just by a little, it won't matter because the amount of insulin that you'll need will be less. And, and that was the key. And I would say that to anybody who's challenged with diabetes, if you don't have these up and down blood sugars, then you won't have to suffer from the, all the complications of diabetes, and it'll be so much easier to match the medicine you're taking with the uh, glucose and the insulin so that everything kind of works out. So it's really important to understand that that's the secret. That's what Dr. Bernstein did, who wrote the book Diabetes Solution. That's what Type 1 Grit Diabetes uh, Facebook group did. And they even have a study where the Type 1 Grit group, along with Dr. Eric Westman, uh, uh, Dykeman, and others were able to show that people with type 1 diabetes can actually have an A1C average of 5.6 or better. Now, think about that. And what they do to achieve that is that they're on a keto diet. They have about 36 grams of carbs per day. They don't have to struggle with uh, glycemic variability, and they don't have to worry about losing 12 years of life because they have a of an approach where they use insulin plus their diet. And, and the beautiful thing about this approach that if you keep your carbs down with a keto diet and you're type two and you are not insulin dependent, you will be able to reverse it completely. So it's really those few people who end up with a type one diabetes diagnosis who have to just manage it. But for most people, you can actually literally reverse diabetes. And one more tip, if you are a person with diabetes and you've never had an A1C test, uh, uh, should I say a C-peptide test, if you've never had a C-peptide test, you need to get it because that is the one test that will tell you whether or not you have type 1 or type 2. And if you have never had that test, then you won't know if your diabetes re is reversible. You need to be making some insulin because a C-peptide is the precursor to pre-insulin and later insulin and it'll tell you if you have a chance to reverse this medical condition. So I'm so glad to hear about your wife, that she's managed her type 1 diabetes. In terms of your patients, I know that there's been some success stories there. Can you share some of those? Yes. Um, I've had some incredible uh, stories of success with my patients, and it's really uh, foundational in uh, making me a doctor who helps people to heal. The person that comes, I have a couple of people, I guess when it comes to type 1 diabetes, I'll, I'll go there. I actually had a, a previous guest on my podcast. His name is Otis Smith. And what I love about Otis Smith is that he is an engineer. And as you know, engineers are problem solvers. And so I said to Otis, I said, you're just like my wife, my friend. You know, we did a C-peptide on him. He did not know that he had type 1 diabetes when I met him. Nobody had ever done a C-peptide test. So I did the test, and unfortunately for him, the test was very low, and it showed that he did not have type 2 but had type 1 diabetes. So I said, Otis, uh, I said the same thing that my wife learned. I said, you know, if you don't get this A1C, which was at 9 down, you may lose anywhere from 12 to 15 years of life. So Otis, he said, okay, I'm an engineer what do I need to do? And what he did is he also was given that education about avoiding glycemic variability. So I said, let's get those carbs less than about 30 or 20 a day. And what he did is he took that challenge on. And so you got a guy whose A1C was at nine, and now it ranges between like 5.5 and six. And he simply did this by reducing his carbs and educating himself. And, and I'll be honest, he's an engineer. So he, he counts carbs every day. He thinks about what he's going to eat every day. He plans around what he's going to eat every day. And it sounds like a bit, a bit of a headache, but a bigger headache is having kidney failure. A bigger headache is dealing with the complications of uh, uh, high sugars leading to a poor circulation in your legs and you have peripheral vascular disease. A bigger headache is having peripheral vascular uh, or a, a diabetic neuropathy where your nerves are so painful that you can't even walk. A bigger headache is having a stroke or a heart attack. So, so, what, I, so what he learned is that I don't want to, that's not my destiny. I want to be here with my family. And, and he was so inspired 
to do exactly what was recommended. And for him, it just took having the knowledge. For some people, I give them my uh, low carb, high fat handout two pager and that's what they need. For some people, they need to have a lifestyle coach. And I know that we do coaching in a lot of these platforms to help people survive. Some people need a therapist because they're having issues at home and they need support there. So I don't really care what people need. My job as a doctor, just like him being a problem solver, him being an engineer, is that I need to problem solve why my patients struggle and figure out what they'll need to get over that struggle. And if we can do that together, there's a victory. And my goal is also to provide hope because they hear from me things they don't hear from other doctors. Yes, you can reverse type 2 diabetes. Yes, you can have type 1 diabetes on insulin and have a normal A1C like the type 1 uh, grit group with Facebook. You, this is very possible because if they can do it, why can't you do it? And Otis and my wife have proven that they can do it as well. I think this is really cool. The world's first carnival app, Go Carnival. Go Carnival is like no other. It has free 90-day carnival challenges, customized recipes, live meetings with carnival doctors, including Dr. Anthony Chafee, Dr. Bright, and Dr. Kilts. So many courses and so many more carnival tools to help you get the best results. For more information, go to the URL shown on the screen gocarnival.com or there is a clickable link in the description of this video. Let's now talk about the causes of high blood sugar. We're going to talk about food and we're also going to talk about other causes of high blood sugar. You mentioned carbohydrates. Now carbohydrates, it's a big term. So there's different things that qualify for carbohydrates. Let's go through them one by one so people are very clear. The first one is starchy carbs. How does that impact blood sugar? Well, I think it's really important for people to understand there there are um, three macronutrients is carbs, protein, and fat. So the first concept is carbs of all the macronutrients, and you only have three, are the one carbs, uh, the one macronutrient that will raise your blood sugar the most. Will protein raise your sugar, your blood glucose a little bit? Sure. Will fat raise it a little bit? Sure. But that's the, that, that's the one that has the biggest impact on whether or not you're gonna struggle. So when you think about the vegetables we eat, right, it is very clear that the starchier vegetables uh, are the ones that are gonna harm us the most. So we wanna avoid starchy foods, things like you know uh, potatoes, uh, things like pasta. Uh, those types of things have uh, a high carb number. So let's just take an example like a potato. Uh, a potato can have as many as 40 carbs. And if you do the math, if you divide that 40 by four, you can get approximately the teaspoons of sugar. So what logical person who has type one or type two diabetes thinks it's a good idea to take that 40 divided by four and you get 10 teaspoons of sugar and they think that's a good idea. So, so avoid starchy foods with high glycemic index because you're going to be chasing your tail. And then you're going to be guessing, as I suggested earlier, is it 40 carbs or is it 30 or is it 45 or 50? So you're guessing and then you're trying to match that medicine to deal with that glucose spike. And there's, there's no way that your body's going to match that spike perfectly. So the better approach, instead of eating a starchy potato, maybe you'll use cauliflower mash. Something like that only has about six or seven carbs. So that would be a better option for a person who's trying to cut back on their starchy foods. And even if it's rice as well, because I'm Indian. So people, Indians, they love their rice. Okay. And people out there, they love rice, but rice is also a starchy carb and you can use cauliflower rice as well. Yeah. And I'll even comment on that to say, I went to school and me and my wife, we met uh, in New Orleans and we went to a school called Xavier and you know, they, they red beans and rice. I mean, it was like pretty much a standard staple every single Friday we had red beans and rice. And you're right, uh, rice and grains in general, I don't care if it's quinoa or brown rice, they all have about 40 to 45 carbs. So what person think is a good idea in the name of, well, we need fiber. So I'm going to eat the rice for the fiber, especially the brown rice. Well, it's 45 carbs divided by four is 11 teaspoons of sugar. So if you eat something with 11 teaspoons of sugar, that's going to wreak havoc on your body. And so when you think of, and, and a lot of these grains are highly refined when you think about wheat. And when they're broken down, 
they're broken down into sugar. And a lot of these grains also have gluten. And just like glue, gluten is going to cause inflammation in your intestine, increasing your risk for leaky gut, and it negatively affects the hormones in your body like the cortisols and the leptins. And when you have those hormones uh, hormones being off, you're going to have uh, spikes in your insulin. So grains are a problem. They're starchy. And the starchy vegetables like potatoes are a problem. And of course, the pastas, those are the things we absolutely want to avoid because we have alternatives. If we didn't have alternatives to those foods like the cauliflower rice and the mashed cauliflower then I would understand that would be tougher. But we do have alternatives, and and that'll prevent all the complications by simply avoiding those spikes. Okay, next one is sugar. How does sugar affect blood sugar? (laughs) Great question, right? It's kind of logical because of how you framed it. But at the end of the day, uh, your uh, spike in your blood sugar is going to be great if you have a source of sugar. Now, sugar is just a really highly processed Uh, source of uh, nutrition. And if you think about uh, taking, I remember uh, my wife, my wife's from the South and in the South, uh, they would typically, her dad would sometimes send sugar cane to us. So she'll take a a big uh, knife and cut it open and, and she would like suck on it to get the sugar taste out, right? Well, that's probably not as bad as you that, uh, you know, going into the lab and taking the sugar cane and then you turn it into a powder. When you turn it into a powder, just like cocaine, it becomes a drug. And when you put that in your body, because it's so highly concentrated, it's going to cause your blood sugar to spike. So when you're drinking things like soda, it's going to make your blood sugar spike. The interesting thing that people don't realize is that those so-called healthier things like uh, the juices, you're basically squeezing the juice or the sugar out of that fruit and that's going to spike your blood sugar as well. Your body doesn't know the difference, particularly if you have diabetes, between uh, a healthier source of sugar and a uh, maybe a more uh, you know artificial. So even if you eat things like raw honey or maple syrup, they do have extra nutrients in it. But those extra nutrients don't justify the sugar spike because your problem is that you can't tolerate that blood glucose spike compared to maybe a person who's younger, who's more athletic. I do not think the average person tolerates that who has metabolic disease and insulin resistance. But more importantly, we have alternatives. And those alternatives are things like uh, the, the pure stevia, pure monk fruit, or something like allulose. Those are alternatives that will not spike your blood sugar. So why not use those versions of sweet versus the ones that cause harm. Because again, if you eat the ones that cause harm, you will suffer the consequences down the road. So I would advise advise anyone, stay away from processed grains and stay away from processed sugar. But recognizing that even the grains that are not processed are still going to spike your blood sugar. And with sugar, the reason why it's so bad is because it is 50% glucose and 50% fructose. So can you elaborate, because I think people know what glucose is, you know, pretty bad sugar. Why is fructose so deadly and so dangerous? Yeah, you know, fructose or fructose, depending on what neighborhood you're from, um, they both are, uh, that particular substance is worse than sugar, primarily because it's metabolized in the liver pretty much exclusively. So when you think about, people will say, well, uh, carbohydrates uh, lead to a fatty liver, and that's true. In fact, a lot of people think if you eat fat in your diet, it's going to make your liver fatty. That's actually not true. It's actually the carbs. But of the sources of sugar, uh, fructose, uh, rather it's from agave nectar or just pure uh, fructose or fructose, that's going to then be metabolized in your liver and your liver just simply can't handle it. It's, it's toxic. So it's going to end up storing fat in your liver, leading to fatty liver, and that's going to make your metabolic function dysfunctional. And and you really want to use a different source of fuel. So if you're going to have any kind of source of sugar or glucose, it's better not be fru- fructose because ultimately your body can better metabolize it. So I tell patients, whenever you think about this high fructose corn syrup that's added to literally everything on the shelf, that is really poison to your body. And if you can avoid that, 
uh, that's a much better approach than to tell, you know, to consume something like that. And the next one I want to talk about is fruit. Why is fruit also in the context of blood sugar? Why is fruit not the best? Well, it go. This is what I love about um, having some common sense, right? So a lot of times it's not what you're saying, it's not what I'm saying, it's what that meter says. So I think the best way to determine what you should or shouldn't eat is to have a meter or a continuous glucose monitor. So let's imagine that you decide, I need my banana because I need my potassium. And you've, you'll hear a lot of clinicians saying, bananas are okay, it's a healthy source of sugar, that's fine. But if you take a typical banana, the number of carbs for a banana is going to be somewhere between a medium is probably like 28 carbs and a large banana can be as high as 35 carbs. So if you do the math and you say, you say 28 divided by four, that's seven teaspoons of sugar. So even if that banana has a ton of potassium, it has phytonutrients, it has antioxidants and other things that are healthy for you, you can't really justify. You can't justify that, that spike in your blood sugar because you think those other things are more beneficial. Now, the, so, so what I tell patients, there are, first of all, if you're gonna eat some type of fruit, and the avocado is an example of a fruit, has a lot of fat in it, that source of potassium may be a better source of potassium, that fruit, because it doesn't spike your blood sugar. And you get potassium in other things, like your spinach, for example. So, so a logical person would use their meter, meter or a continuous glucose monitor to determine what foods to eat. In fact, if I never gave my patients a handout saying, eat this, don't eat that, all I would have to do is say, here's your meter, here's your continuous glucose monitor, and I want you to eat food. And whenever you eat a food that spikes your blood sugar, avoid that food in the future. And what they'll find is that they're not going to be eating a lot of fruit if they do that. They may find themselves getting away with some berries, but for the most part, I, I put fruit down, as some people have heard, as nature's candy. So if they're going to have a, a moment of an indulgence, maybe that's a moment to have fruit. But for a person with insulin resistance, a person with uh, diabetes, or even a person with a high blood pressure, because your blood pressure is a hyperinsulinemia problem, I tell them to avoid fruit and only use berries primarily when they want to indulge. So, And then use their meter as their guide to decide what they should and shouldn't be eating. Absolutely. And fruit is a very controversial, I mean, it's a confusing topic. That's why I partnered with Go Carnivore and we're providing a full list of fruits. So even if you're transitioning from, you know, a standard American diet, low carb to a carnivore or keto diet, and you want to have some fruit, this will be a complete list to look at what are the best fruits to eat. It's beyond berries. There's actually a lot of things that you can eat, but on the other side, it's so shocking with all the like pomegranate. I didn't know, I don't eat fruit, but I'm just saying that pomegranate has so much sugar in it and nobody thinks that. Yeah. And a lot of people think it's a good option, but the reality is they would know that if they checked their blood sugar. And, and that's why even people who don't have diabetes, there's benefit of having a continuous glucose monitor just to see if, even if it's not your diet, is this activity too stressful and it's spiking my sugar? Uh, and is my sleep affecting my sugar? And your sugars are spiking because you're not getting enough sleep. Is my relationship spiking my sugar? So, so a lot of times, you know, having data to make a decision about what you should and shouldn't eat is a very logical, effective way to approach this. Because if you have data, then you can say, oh, A equals B. I understand now what I should do. And the good news is there's so many things you can eat that won't spike your blood sugar. So you're not going to suffer. Uh, people say, man, you're carnivore. Don't you get bored? No, I love ribeye. So there's no boring for me. And if I have a, if I'm doing like a, a ketovore week, I'll, I'll eat a guacamole because that doesn't spike my blood sugar either. So there's ways to mitigate that. And Having data is so critical. Let's go to the next one, which is galactose, which is part of a carbohydrate. It's a sugar. What is galactose? I think it's important that we understand that you're going to hear all these terms and they sound uh, very, uh, <laughs> you know, similar. And, and I think it's important that we understand that they're, um, you know, galactose uh, versus glucose. And at the end of the day, uh, they have structural differences in terms of, uh, you know, where the carbon is located 
and um and 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 really fructose we talked about that earlier it's really a, a an isomer of glucose and galactose so it's really just about uh where the atoms are uh arranged on the uh it's like biochemistry i was actually a chemistry major back in the day in college you know but at the uh, at the end of the day i think of glucose to be honest as a little bit more stable than galactose i think about uh, glucose as um, l- less susceptible to uh, cause harm as galactose. So at the end of the day, I try to tell people uh, to avoid uh, galactose in general. And, uh, on, and although these are all forms of uh, glucose that can, or, or, or energy that can impact your body uh, for a source of energy, I think in general, your primary source of fuel should be protein and fat, and then all of these other forms of uh, uh, glucose should be avoided in general or, or forms of sugar. So galactose is milk sugar, right? So it's like think of milk, anything dairy, it's a sugar. So that's why they call it this fancy term. But when you think about all sugars, whether it comes from fruit, rice, pasta, bread, milk, it's all sugars. We need to reduce it if we want to reduce our blood sugar. Is that correct? Absolutely, and and I think I think um, there are other sources of galactose. Uh, we think about things like um, you know dates and papaya. Uh, we think about bell peppers, tomatoes, and watermelon. And and again, in in certain forms, it's not as bad. But at the end of the day, uh, I think that you just need to be a, have awareness that there are different forms of uh, you know, things that can raise your sugar. This just happens to be one. But when I think about galactose, I do think about those types of uh, fruit. And again, as a carnivore, I don't really have to worry about this because I just don't consume <laughs> these things for the most part. So the chances that I'll have a... It's hard to find a carnivore who uh, suffers from diabetes. Uh, and if they do, they won't have it for long unless they have type one diabetes. And it goes on to the next one, which is protein. So we spoke about all the carbohydrates, which if you're carnivore, if you're keto, you don't eat much of, but we do eat so much protein, but many people want to know, does protein increase your blood sugar? Protein does. And, and this is a conversation I had to have with Otis Smith, uh, and my wife, and it's actually, um, if anybody looks at a, a car protein uh, fat graph, right, you'll notice that the protein does raise your blood sugar, right? So, so when I talk to uh, when I talk to a type one uh, diabetic, I say to them, "What about the protein, right?" So, so you do have to factor that in, and but the key is there's if they're if they're on insulin, and they're trying to match their spike in protein, uh, there are some insulins that are very fast acting, right? And those insulins will pretty much target the blood, the the carbs, because your blood, your carbs is what's going to spike your blood sugar the quickest, right? So now what about the protein, which takes a little longer to go up? And so you want to do more of a regular insulin. So one of the problems and disconnects we have in healthcare, and this is so shocking, Imagine a person trained in endocrinology who's the expert on diabetes care, and they're saying to people, oh, uh, protein, that's a, you got a free pass on that. But yet you can look at a graph and see that the protein does elevate your blood sugar. So that's not a logical statement. So, so if I have a person who's taken a, a fast-acting insulin and they're trying to keep their blood sugars under control, I probably will fix them to a regular insulin because if they eat a steak, it's going to have a little bit of a bump, but the regular insulin is going to match that protein better than it's going to, than, than maybe a uh, person who's taking, you know, on a higher carb diet. So I think that's a very important uh, concept that you brought up because ultimately if you have diabetes and you're on insulin, there's two things you have to do. Number one, you have to reduce the carbs so that you don't have that glycemic variability. Number two, you may have to adjust your medicine so that you're taking a longer acting insulin like a Lantus or a Levamir, but you're also taking, you may switch from a short acting insulin to a regular insulin. So you, so when you're eating your ribeye, you can kind of uh, treat that protein. So, and, and protein is really nice for your body because instead of it causing big spikes, 
it, it, it causes smaller spikes that the medicine can mitigate. And later on, if you need a little glucose down the road, there's a process called gluconeogenesis where you will convert that protein into a source of fuel uh, in the form of glucose uh, from gluconeogenesis. And what happens is your body kind of does that more on demand, uh, particularly for a person who's still making insulin. And, and it does it in a way that you, you won't have to deal with this roller coaster. Because again, we're trying to avoid that glycemic variability and you, can, and you have to micromanage this a little bit, but it's so worth it because you gain those 12 years of life back. You don't have to deal with the complications of diabetes. So uh, when people say, this is hard, doc, I say it's not as hard as those complications. Absolutely. And what if somebody is not diabetic? If they eat a lot of protein, should they be worried about blood sugar spikes? Your body is magnificently made, right? So I doubt that most people uh, who have who don't have diabetes, and that would imply they don't have insulin resistance, need to really worry about protein. Uh, I'm I'm like a lion. I'm not a, quite a lion diet person, so I do, <laughs> you know, have a little bit more flexibility with my carnivore diet. But uh, just like the lion, uh, you know, I eat until I'm full. I do not worry that I'm overeating uh, protein because I've been given this magnificent body that knows better than I. So my body will tell me when I'm done eating protein because it'll make me not want to eat any more protein. And I think that's a better approach to listen to your body, eat until you're full, full, and you're eating a, uh, a source of nutrition with fat and protein that's very unlikely to raise your blood sugar, lead to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia compared to eating a diet high in carbs. If you think about the average American, for those who are in America, we eat anywhere from 250 to 400 carbs per day, per person. And uh, imagine giving your body a break and you're eating zero carbs, or maybe you're eating less than 30 and you're doing keto. Your body has time to recover, heal, and do the other functions of your body. And by the way, when you eat this way, you don't get hungry. So we can fast almost seamlessly. My, so often I come home, and, you know, like even the night before this recording, uh, the food wasn't, we didn't prepare well. So I decided to air fry some chicken uh, for my family. And it's like 730 at night. And I wasn't even hungry at 730 at night, ha having eaten only one thing for lunch, which was uh, maybe a ribeye. You don't get hungry and people can't believe that that's a reality. They can't believe that by eating protein and fat that you don't get hungry. But that's what life can look like for so many people. And, and what happens is that's one of the biggest factors that make us struggle. Because if I'm trying to make a, a lifestyle change, particularly as we celebrate a new year, how am I going to do that if I'm always hungry? When I was, a, I was a vegetarian, I don't know if I shared this with you, but I was a vegetarian for eight years prior to 10, 11 years ago when I decided to go low carb keto and now carnivore. And I grazed like a cow. I, I had to eat all the time. And unfortunately, when you eat all the time, that high fiber food, you spend a lot of time in the bathroom as well. I don't have to worry about going to the bathroom anymore. I don't have to worry about the, the bloating and inflammation that occurred in my stomach anymore. And, and I simply eat foods once or twice a day that are high in fat and protein, and I feel great. And, and what's really, really awesome about this is that my mental clarity is through the roof. My sense of wellness is through the roof. My ability to concentrate and focus and be present and energetic for my patients is through the roof. And, and, I, and even we recorded this early, right? Well, guess what? I, I wake up with, you know, I tend to get about six or seven hours of sleep. But if I get about, since I've been carnivore, it seems like I need less sleep. And then I wake up well rested and I wake up ready to go. So when I am in the world, I give the world and the universe so much more of me. So Dr. Hampton is bringing positive energy to the clinic. And at the end of the day, I'm bringing positive energy to my wife, and if my kids are around, to my kids. And, and it just never ends. And so it's really a new way of living. And again, for people who've never experienced that, they can't imagine that that's true because they've, they've been in this fog so long and, and then they're talking to their clinicians and the clinicians are telling them the opposite of what we're saying. And they are confused and they don't know who to trust. But I promise you, even the large organizations, the American Diabetes Association, 
the American Heart Association, and and even the you know Association for Clinical Endocrinology all say that low carb is okay. So when your doctor pushes back and says, I don't know if that's good for you, well, these large organizations are saying it's okay. And even for blood pressure, and I'll end with this comment, they had a study in 2023 in June saying that they compared the DASH diet to the keto diet. And guess what? The keto diet blew away this so-called standard diet that we've been using for years. The dietary approach to stop hypertension, twice as effective for blood pressure, three times effective as effective for diabetes, and of course, twice as effective for weight loss. So now we have data that'll support a belief that the logical conclusion that we already knew that eating all those grains, which is recommended with the DASH diet in Mediterranean, is not effective against diabetes because it's going to spike your blood sugar. And by the way, your blood pressure is a sugar problem. And by the way, Dementia is a sugar problem. Oh, by the way, the risk for cancer is a sugar problem. So if I keep eating foods that spike my blood sugar, then my risk for all of those things will be elevated. That means less time with my family. And if I'm here at the age of 85 and 90, wouldn't it be nice to be here with mental clarity and, and being able to know you're here and you're not suffering from dementia? Wouldn't it be nice to not be worried about cancer? And as your previous guests have talked about, we can, we can prevent cancer if we understand it's a metabolic disease. We're going to leave this planet for some reason. But if we get that cancer at 95, I can work with that number. I'm not trying to get it at 55. I'm 55 now. I don't need it at this age. So I really love the fact that we have a path for people to have hope and to not worry about the things that so many people in their families have worried about. More importantly, if they can be a model for their family, not being preachy, but say, hey, guys, this is what I've done. If you want more information, I'm here to share it and, and just model for them a better approach. And hopefully they'll inspire their doctors as well. So along with eating more protein, we have to eat more fat. I think people are also worried about, well, can I eat too much fat? And how does fat impact blood sugar levels? So when you think about fat, uh, it's been demonized. Um, so if I'm if I'm a person suffering from diabetes and I have seen the fat protein carb graph, I'll notice immediately, and I share this with my patients, that the fat seems to be the only thing that doesn't raise your blood sugar, right? So the first thing I'm going to say is, Doc, maybe I should be eating more fat because it doesn't raise my blood sugar. And, that, and the answer is, that's correct. But then you say, well, but isn't it going to cause harm? Because I've been told for years that Saturated fat is harmful and can increase my risk for uh, heart disease. Well, the good news is that the Journal of the College of Cardiology looked at all the data. And when they looked at all the studies, particularly the randomized controlled trials, they found that saturated fat was not associated with cardiovascular disease. More importantly, when they made that position statement, they said, oh, by the way, it's beneficial for stroke. So eating fat. And this is logical if you look at the graph, is actually going to help reduce my risk for stroke. And then they say, well, I don't want to eat all that red meat, doc, because I've been told that it's going to increase my risk for cancer. And that's a fair comment. I mean, is, is that true or not true? But when you look at the studies that suggest that red meat causes cancer, particularly with the World Health Organization, they had about 14 or so studies they looked at. Not one of those studies was a randomized controlled trial. They were all observational studies. And as you may know, and many of my uh, podcast followers know, uh, you know, observational studies only show possible correlation, possible association. They do not show causation. Therefore, as a clinician who uses evidence to guide my decisions, I cannot with good faith tell my patients to actually trust the study that's observational. And, 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 and if I did that, I would be at, on the verge of malpractice because you can't trust those studies. Those studies are only give us permission to say, now let's do more research. So what we know now is that the fat in the steak uh, does not, it doesn't really increase your risk for cancer in a substantial way. And by the way, if you, let's just say you decided to trust those observational studies. Your risk for cancer, based on those studies, 
goes from 5% to 6% if you eat five pieces of bacon every day for the rest of your life. So the question becomes, am I going to not eat bacon? First of all, am I going to eat five pieces of bacon every day? And a lot of people wouldn't if they, you know. But if you did, it's going to go from 5 to 6%. So it's, all, so it's part of our job as clinicians and even in, on this platform is to just provide perspective so that people can make better decisions. The good news about keto is that when you look at the Public Health Collaborative, which is an independent organization that looked at all the research, and they looked at, they looked at kind of a low-fat versus low-carb uh, comparison, right? And when it comes to the one of the biggest risk factors other than diabetes, which is what we're talking about today for uh, early mortality, is obesity. So when it comes to significant weight loss, when you look at that, I think it was like 69. It was like literally there was zero low-fat studies that beat the low-carb studies, zero when it comes to significant weight loss. So if that's true then why are we debating this anymore? These are randomized controlled trials, not observational. And so the jury is out. So there's, so we need to remove this myth uh, that keto is harmful. We need to remove this myth that somehow low fat is better. There is no evidence that that's true. And that's what my colleagues need to know. That's what patients need to know. And, and what frustrates me the most is that you shouldn't have to come to a podcast or a YouTube channel to learn this. Health systems should be teaching this to our patients so that they can learn from their trusted health system what's right and wrong. And my goal, which is why I'm in a large health system, Advocate Health in six states, I'm in Chicago. My goal is to move my health system towards that model, towards a model where we teach metabolic health, that lifestyle is the key, and, and tell people that you don't have to suffer from these chronic medical conditions, which are mostly based on what you eat. And once people get that hope back and get, get empowered, they will, they will do what's best for their health and then they'll model for other people. And, and then the world starts to heal. And, and I remember hearing a previous guest of yours talking about cancer, right? Dr. Seafried, I think. And when he talked, he said that in five years, we could reduce cancer by 50%. And, that, and that's not like a make-believe fantasy. That is absolutely what would happen if we changed our health system to one where we teach people how to not, you know, burden the body with all of these inflammatory foods. And it's really a, a, a hopeful message because the genetic model for cancer is not working. And, and, and truth be told, there's a ton of cancers out there that don't have any, any genetic origins. So that tells you, all right, that, that may be part of the story. But what we know for 100% certainty is that metabolic dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction is in 100% of cancers. And you can fix and heal the mitochondria by fixing your diet. So I am so hopeful, and I don't stay up late at night thinking about cancer anymore. I don't stay up late at night worried about getting diabetes anymore. Uh, my, I'm going to tell you some person. My dad was diagnosed with high blood pressure in his 20s. I'm 55 years old. And I was literally at Walmart. My, my wife's a Walmart pharmacist. So she was talking to her colleagues. And I said, let me go by this machine and check my blood pressure. And it was like 110 over 65. My dad was diagnosed with hypertension when he was in his 20s. I'm 55. So for people who believe that they're destined for anything, that is just not true. Because why don't I have the same medical condition as my biological dad? Because of the epigenetics, my, my, my lifestyle may be a little different. My, my, how I deal with stress may be a little different. How much sleep I get may be a little different. Me and my wife, we have relationship coach to help my relationship be healthy. So my pressure is not high when I come home. That's a little different. So I'm doing things that others have not done. And so I anticipate in 10 years that blood pressure is going to be normal. I anticipate in 20 years my blood pressure is going to be normal. And I want that for everybody. I want my patients to experience that. I want the people to follow me on YouTube to experience that. Because why would you not want to be here longer for your family and enjoy the blessing of just enjoying each other for as long as possible? And But more importantly, the quality of your life. Do I really want to take all of those medicines for my blood sugar and my blood pressure with all of the side effects? And for guys, we know blood pressure medicines 
has a significant impact on their manhood. Significant. And I'm not going out like that. Well, you mentioned so many of these fun things that we're going to talk about now, which is the fixes. Let's start with the first one. Uh, I like to call this the 85% solution, but I'm keen to hear if you agree. And that's the ketogenic diet. Yeah, I think, I think diet is the most important factor um, because of the obvious, which is if you have diabetes, the thing that will spike your blood sugar the most is the food you eat, right? So imagine uh, removing the poison. So if I'm, if I'm in a room, and I say this to my patients, when I'm sitting with my patients, I say, guess what? We have a choice right now. Uh, there's a snake in this room, right? So, but don't worry about the snake because I have an antidote. And the antidote is the medicine. So, so you can stay with me and we can have our interaction. And if the snake bites one of us, we'll have a shot we can take. Now, I have not found one patient yet that says that's a good idea, right? So if that's true, if it's true that staying around the poison is not a good idea and rely on their antidote. Well, what's the poison for diabetes? Excessive carbs. My body simply can't manage the carbs as effective as it, as it should be. So instead of looking for the antidote, we remove the poison. So now what I love about keto and, and, and relying on fat fuel instead. So if you get your carbs under 50 a day and, and you could argue less than 20 or 30 a day, um, your body's going to be forced to use fat fuel. And when you use fat fuel, which are ketones, the chances are very high that your blood sugar is going to be easy to manage because you're not relying on your blood sugar as your fuel source anymore. So logic says that the keto diet is a much more effective way to manage your blood sugars because you're relying on a different fuel source. And we already know that the fat fuel is the one that raises your blood sugar the least. So so logic would tell us, rather I'm hearing it, rather I'm using a handout with the low carb or keto diet, or I'm using my meter to guide me, you'll, you'll find that those spikes will go away. And the biggest thing that you'll then have to worry about is how to get off medicines. So we need to live in a world where we have doctors who are trained in metabolic health. That's why I want to do a shout out to the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, uh, Nutrition uh, uh, you know, network that's training doctors like myself who may not have had this exposure to, to learn how to safely de-prescribe medicine. So once you're on a dietary pattern without those spikes, you'll have to get off medicine so you don't have hypoglycemia and particularly insulin. In fact, I may have to take the insulin, cut it in half immediately for people who are on this dietary pattern. Even the American Heart Association that now endorses low carb and keto, right? In their uh, position statement about this, they have a little extra comment. And the extra comment says, for those who are on a keto diet, use caution. And, they, and it's not the caution you were thinking about. You would think that the caution would be don't use the diet because it's dangerous. No, they're saying use caution because the chances of hypoglycemia is so high. Why did they call out that particular dietary pattern? Because it's the most effective diet for diabetes. I want to be on a diet that's going to make me use caution because I have to get off medicines. And what I do in my health system is that we have pharmacists, a uh, pharmacy team that can work with the patient along with me to safely reduce the medicine. And, and they can reach them like literally every other day. And that's a safer approach. But uh, if I were to give you a story about a patient of mine, her name is uh, Gwendolyn Butler. And Gwendolyn Butler came to me. She's a medical assistant. And what happened was she had been on insulin for 11 years. Uh, and, and so what do you do with a person who's on insulin uh, and she's motivated to uh, get off of that insulin? And, and what she ended up doing, and I actually did an episode of the podcast to share her story. She, after she bumped her head, had an MRI, and the MRI showed that she had a microvascular disease, right? That microvascular disease was the trigger for her to know I, I need to do something because I'm either going to have a stroke or have dementia later in life. So, so, so what we did is we, we partnered to, you know, we're kind of going back and forth 
and we got her off of insulin within 45 days. We did it safely, but we did, we did that with the keto diet. So imagine a person who spent the last 11 years on insulin thinking that that was their destiny, right? Nobody's ever told her that she can get off of the insulin. And, and although she didn't hear me at first because she had to bump her head, once she bumped her head and saw that the damage had already start, started, I'm not even sure if she was, I mean, she may be around my age or a little bit younger. And she, that was the wake up call for her. But the whole point of it is we solved it with keto. We solved it with keto. And for some of us, I have an irritable bowel. I have to go to carnivore because that's the best diet for me. I'm not here evangelizing about low carb keto or carnivore. I'm just saying you need to do the experiment. And now, her A1C is in the normal range, and she's not on insulin and has not been on insulin since those 45 days after she got it. That's a couple of years ago. So what a gift to the world when you can say to people that, no, you don't have to take this medicine forever. And it's not good for business if you are a pharmaceutical, right? But, again, but there's plenty. My wife's a type one, so they'll make a decent living. I mean, she has to take insulin. But at the end of the day, that's not my concern. My concern is to help people heal. And if they understand the value of reducing carbs with keto, that is the, if you do that one thing, then you probably won't have to do much else. My job is to then problem solve some of the other reasons why people may struggle, but we start with diet. And if we fix the diet, we fix most most of the reasons why people suffer from diabetes. So I wanted to ask because people also like to take supplements. And the one that I always hear about is berberine. How effective is berberine to lower your blood sugar? I think, I think when we think about um, supplements, I think the first thing is that we need to categorize supplements the same way we categorize medicine. And what I mean by that is supplements are bridge therapy. So we want to use supplements to help us until we get our lifestyle together. So if we, so if we, if we understand that it's bridge therapy, we know that we're only going to be using supplements for a, a short amount of time. Now, having said that, why are supplements helpful? Well, because they actually just, they're, they're kind of like that antidote example I gave. They, if you're, let's just say you're not quite doing low-carb keto or carnivore effectively, and you want to have a little help, and you need a bridge to the lifestyle that you're trying to achieve, there's a few supplements that come to mind, and we'll start with berberine. So what I know from ber for berberine is that if you take that on a daily basis, no question, you're going to lower your blood sugar levels probably from, you know, 15 to 20 percent. So it really does help to reduce your blood sugar in a way that helps you. But again, this is bridge therapy. This is not the solution. So when I talk to patients about diabetes, a lot of times I'll give them, you know, what are the things you need to be thinking about? And it includes berberine, but it also includes other supplements like uh, chromium. Chromium is another supplement that improves insulin sensitivity. And what that means is that your insulin's ability to work effectively is going to be heightened by using that. And when you do that, you're going to reduce the chances that your sugars are going to spike. And, and when your sugars spike uh, or when they don't spike, you won't have spikes in your insulin. And insulin, again, too much insulin is what leads to a lot of these complications of diabetes. The other supplements I think about are cinnamon. And many people have heard that cinnamon is an effective supplement as well. And, and what I love about cinnamon as well is that it doesn't just reduce your blood sugar levels. It also reduces your triglyceride levels. And, 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 and one of the metabolic markers is your triglycerides. You don't want that to be too high because that's like fat floating around. You don't want that in your blood sugar um, or in your blood. But you also will uh, also increase the good cholesterol, which is the HDL. And, and so, and although we don't care so much about LDL, you also reduce your LDL with, uh, uh, with uh, cinnamon. So I really like that. So if you put a little bit of uh, cinnamon in your food, they even have essential oils uh, that you can use internally or even on your skin. The skin is like a, a very absorptive uh, 
uh, organ that can do a good job with that. The other thing that comes to mind is uh, something called alpha lipoic acid. And, and that's on my list of things I tell people. If you want to use supplements, you want to consider that as well. Uh, just like some of the previous ones, increases insulin sensitivity. And, and it's particularly helpful for people whose nerves have been damaged. So if you have that diabetic neuropathy, nerve pain issue, it'll help to heal your nerves uh, a little faster than if you don't use it. And the only other thing that comes to mind uh, is bitter uh, melon extract. That's a supplement you can take as well. Uh, that's something that also will help lower your blood glucose levels. And, and, and again, but the bigger message is not, you know, should I take supplements? You know, what, what I don't want is my patients to, uh, you know, go from a bag of medicine to a bag of supplements, right? So supplements are okay, particularly when you target certain medical conditions. So if my only medical condition is diabetes, then I will target these supplements. If, I, if my only medical condition is hypertension, I think about uh, garlic uh, supplements. I think about magnesium for the blood pressure. I think about omega-3, CoQ10, even apple cider vinegar. Those are things I think those are, that's okay to do. But the big message is, is bridge therapy. So, because I don't want you to, you know, 10 years from now, you're doing well, you're eating well, and you feel obligated to take all these supplements. That's not necessary. All you're obligated to do is to do a keto or carnivore diet. If you do that, you don't need to take any of that stuff. In fact, the only supplements I take today as a carnivore, I take omega-3 because I don't eat enough fish. I'm a ribeye guy. I take vitamin D, particularly with my dark skin, because I may not get enough vitamin D from the sun. And I may periodically take electrolytes uh, because I think uh, if I, if I, sometimes I'll notice I have a cramp in my toes or something, and I know it's a, an electrolyte issue. But for the most part, when you eat the way we're talking about, you will get most of your nutrition from your diet. So to spend all of this, imagine the money you spend. Imagine if you're, you have blood pressure and diabetes problems, and, and just a few I've mentioned, and you take all of those. You're, you're, you're playing with your pocketbook, and it's not necessary. So if anybody tells you it's necessary, and I have a master's in nutrition and functional medicine, I learned about all of these things in school, and I, and I think they add value, but I think they add less value than a keto or carnivore diet. So that's my message to your audience is fix your diet, just like my book title, Fix Your Diabetes. <laughs> that's the key. And if you fix that, you won't have to spend all your resources on all of these supplements. Absolutely. So if somebody fixes their diet, the 85%, um, how long does it take to heal? So they want to lower their blood sugar, get off their medications, reverse disease. How long is that? I think it depends on the person in front of you, right? So if I, so the, so if I talk about uh, Gwendolyn Butler, she healed it fairly quickly. It was 45 days. If I talk about Otis Smith, it took him about two to three months, right? To not reverse type one, because you can't reverse that, but certainly to get his A1C from nine to, to six or so. Uh, or five. So, so I think it depends on how insulin resistant you are. I have patients who weigh three, four hundred pounds, right? And what's but but what's magical about the the four hundred pound patient? They'll come in and have lost only thirty pounds, and their numbers plummet. Things get better immediately, right? So they may not be perfectly metabolically healthy because when you have a lot of fat cells, that'll also lead to a little insulin resistance. So you have to deal with that. But I think it just depends on the person. But for most people, let's just think about Dr. Jason Fong because he incorporates intermittent fasting, right? He, ha he takes people off with a team, off medicines within a month. So, so the key is if you have the proper guidance, and, and by the way, the Society of Health, Metabolic Health Practitioners have um, you know, the guide for therapeutic carb restriction. So if you're working with a doctor who's not metabolically trained, maybe go to that site, download the guidelines for therapeutic carb restriction, and you share that with your doctor. And, or go to Diet Doctor, and they have a free continuing medical education course on low carb for doctors. So download that or mention it to your doctor and say, hey, there's a course. Would you walk with me? Because what we're trying to do is walk with people. Uh, you don't have to be 
a metabolic doc. You don't have to be have a board certification in <laughs> in obesity medicine or have a master's in nutrition. You just need to walk with people. They need somebody they can trust who will hold their hand so that they can then make these changes safely. And I think that if we have a world where people are are humble and willing to say, I didn't quite know that, but I'm willing to learn, that's the kind of clinician I want to work with. I don't expect you. I mean, if if you had mentioned, uh, uh, you know, some nutrient I didn't know, I would say, you know what? Let me check that out. Let me look that up. Let me find out what I need to learn. And then the next visit, we'll talk about it. That's the world I want to live in, not a world where we're afraid to say, I don't know. I'm not sure. I've been, I've only been a carnivore for about a year and a half or so. So I'm not an expert on carnivore. But what I will tell you is that if you have a question about carnivore I don't know, I will do the research and I'll circle back and get an answer for you. Because then I learn and then the next person who asks that question, I'll have an answer for them. And we all need to support this movement just to level the playing field so that people are not indoctrinated into beliefs that maybe uh, the blue zones is the answer. Well, guess what? There's a ton of things we learn from the blue zones that are true. But one thing that's not true is that it's a, a plant-based uh, platform. Every blue zones, I did a video about that. All the blue zones eat meat or, or fish. So to say it's plant-based is uh, disingenuous. And I just wish people were honest and saying, you know, I preferred plant-based, uh, but, uh, you know, here are my pros and cons. But to say... What it's, you know, to make up things is just really disingenuous. So I just want to live in a world where we, where we honor that. I don't want to live in a world where my kids can't eat meat on Mondays and Fridays like in New York at the schools. Because I would never, yes, Mon Mondays and Fridays, the mayor is very plant-based, God bless him. But would he be okay if we said you only can eat meat on Mondays and Fridays? Do we really want to live in a world where that's the narrative? And the answer is no, we don't want to live in a world where we're told we have to eat meat on Mondays and Fridays, although we would like to. We want to live in a world where everybody has a choice, where you give people information and they make their own decisions about what's best for their family. That's a better model. That's the way we should move forward. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Now you need to watch this video next with Dr. Ken Berry. He'll teach you how to start the carnival diet the right way and the 90-day carnival challenge. I'll see you guys next week.